And welcome to episode 13 of Game Theory, our podcast about strategy, decision making, and competition. Chris, as the day that this drops, which is in August sometime, is National Equality Day. So we're talking about an equitable issue in Wyoming. Yeah, we most certainly are, Nick. Equality is very important to me. Although I would say some other values are probably more equal than equality, uh, but it's up there. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. So the for those of you that don't know us, we hail from the great state of Wyoming. You can see if you're watching on YouTube, the painting behind me is a fictional painting of Jackson, Wyoming and Jackson Hole and the Tetons. And so we, that's where we're from. There are little known facts about Wyoming, one of which is that Decisions made by Wyoming legislators and lawmakers in the late 19th century sped up the right the rights that women have in the world by maybe decades, plural. And so we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about the underlying political reasons that things did or didn't happen. Yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting, interesting history there for sure. And uh, I think there's a legacy that carries through uh, to today. I mean, Wyoming's women are drivers of change. There are a lot of progressive voices, a lot of visionary voices, but they're also rooted in down-home values like hard work and self-determination and grit. And it's really inspiring to see. Yeah. So let's just start with uh, a couple quick facts. As far as we know them, and we researched this one a little bit more seriously because we're putting you know our name on it and this is where we're from and whatnot. So first fact is that Wyoming got the, the women in Wyoming as a territory got the right to vote in territorial elections first. And that happened in 1869. Other rights that women got in the same bill and then subsequently included the right to serve on juries, the right to be appointed, and the right to be elected. What else do we have? Well, Nick, there's a whole bunch of firsts. So, so we scoured the interweb for as many resources as we could find outlining the history of Wyoming's women. And they're everywhere. I mean, it's, it's a real legacy for the state in a way that I think is kind of unique among U.S. states and territories. Uh, there are some really incredible milestones here. So, Nick, as you said, we're going to circle back to this one here in a little bit because there's some controversy associated with it. But Wyoming was the first state or territory to grant universal suffrage. That's true in the U.S. And there are claims that it's true around the world. But we'll get back to that because there's a little bit of uh, additional history to know there. Uh, Wyoming also had the first ever female justice of the peace in the United States. That was Esther Hobart Morris. And she became a female justice of the, well, she became a justice of the peace. And she happened to be a woman uh, in South Pass City in 1870. Nick, we've been to South Pass a couple of times. A couple of times. And I wonder if they had that cool gift shop there in the 1870s. Right. <laughs> yeah, Nick. And then I don't know if you mentioned there was the first woman or the first women to serve on a jury in the United States. So that happened in 1870 in Laramie. There was a grand jury that got sworn in in March uh, in a case. Uh, women were also sworn in on a petite jury. So the legalists out there will know what that means. I don't really know what it means, but I know what a grand jury is. Uh, and they were sworn into a petite jury in April 1870. Uh, accompanying that was actually also the first female bailiff in the United States. So Martha Simons Boys Atkinson was her name. Uh, she was appointed to see to the needs of the first female jurors uh, in the 1870 case in Laramie. So pretty neat. That it would, I thought I remember you telling me something about that, like that changed pretty shortly after the first grand jury and petit jury, right? Yeah. So there, the, and then this is what we need to start. We're going to start with the, the good and the bad. So I think starting with the bad might be um, the way to go here. And the bad is sort of... Uh, not all of these laws were made for good. Like there weren't nefarious reasons. It just wasn't the kindness of their hearts and uh, feminism wasn't at the, the heart of all of this necessarily, but politics was and, and, and uh, definitely a lot of sexism and, and gender roles were part of this. And so that, that happened on juries uh, as well. The first and most important thing to think about juries is how women were perceived in the home and what their quote unquote roles were and whatnot. So the first time the law goes through is in 1869, the jury part was allegedly, according to newspaper articles, the most controversial part of the women's suffrage, the multi-right women's suffrage act, because A, uh, the women were supposed to be in the home with their families. Not a lot of women were earning wages, especially in Wyoming. 
uh, families were sort of dragged westward to find a better life or find gold. And we'll talk about South Pass City in a second. So it needed to be with the family or whatever. So that was part of the, the controversy. They were also going to be in a room where they would hear unseemly testimony and they would be put in close quarters with male jurors. And like, there are some, there's some sketchy uh, resources here, including like newspaper articles and whatnot. This was something that had been tried in Utah and Idaho here and there. Like what would happen if we put women on juries and people were very worried about what would happen if they put them in, like locked one woman in a room with 11 men. And apparently there were bad things that happened. Um, journalism and AP style and you know, women's rights and the Me Too movement hadn't come around. So we don't know what those were. So the law for women serving on juries uh, dissipated as quickly as it had arrived. So, and that I believe from what we, and I can't confirm this, but it does appear that A, women need to be in the home was the thinking at the time. And B, like there was some, some crap happening. Um, and I don't, I didn't even want to allege more than that because it couldn't like, get it confirmed. But locking a woman in, in deliberative rooms with other men seemed to be a bad situation. Women, of course, were invited to serve on juries and had the right to serve on juries later, like years later, but not like a crazy amount of years later, like 10 years later or something. But that was the most controversial part of this. And it went so far in Wyoming that certain district judges said that women were required to serve on juries. So that was by far the, the at that time, the most hotly contested part of this in the day-to-day -day lives of Wyomingites. Yeah. So obviously not a lot of uh, pure motivations there, but let's get back to the, some of the good, more positive developments here. So along with the first ever general election in which women voted, uh, that took place in 1870. Uh, a woman by the name of Louisa Swain, who was from Laramie, cast the first ever documented vote by a woman in Wyoming. Uh, Augusta C. Howe lived in Cheyenne, which is just down the road. Uh, surprisingly dangerous drive for those of you who uh, haven't ever done it. And I can't imagine trying to make that journey on your own any more than once or twice like, a year. We live there, so you think about what it's like in colonial times, but I didn't even think about that drive. Oh, man. Yeah. No, that's that's brutal. Uh, but just down the road and over the pass, uh, Augusta Howe, uh, allegedly, uh, she was the first woman to cast a vote in Cheyenne, uh, but apparently she was 30 minutes behind Louisa Swain. So this is an early bird gets the word situation. I don't know how precisely they were keeping time back then. Maybe it's within the margin of error, or plus or minus 30 minutes. I don't know. They might have had some good pocket watches or something. But Louisa Swain uh, cast the first vote in general election for Wyoming women. And then, as you might know, Wyoming didn't become a state until eight, 1890. Uh, and so there wasn't a presidential election until then. And then in 1892, Wyoming was the only state in the union uh, that had women's suffrage. So two-year-old state setting the example for colonies that had been there for Long time. Right, Chris. So we're going to get back to some of the underlying reasons and whatnot, but I, I, a huge part of why this is on game theory, and this is not a history show per se, but it is the strategy for larger decision making and what can happen. So there are examples of Wyoming needs a certain amount of voters to be, become a state, to get ratified or whatever. So expanding the right to vote makes sense. That's not necessarily as true as people think, but that is part of this. However, the other thing that was going on at this time, I wouldn't call it gerrymandering. I would call it rights mandering, frankly. And that has to do with people who were freed former slaves after the Civil War being guaranteed the right to vote, I believe, by the 14th Amendment of the United States. There were different things happening in different parts of the country. And Wyoming kind of decided that if we're going to give former slaves, and that's not the word they used, not the word they used, and this is according to a newspaper, and if mm -hmm. we're going to give Chinese immigrant laborers, not the word they used, and this guy, the governor, was like, if we're going to give those people the right to vote, screw it, give women the right to vote as well, which I don't know how to feel about that line of thinking, and there was a column in a newspaper that alleged that perhaps he was joking, Wait, which newspaper? I don't know. It's like it doesn't exist anymore. I'll find me pull up. Let's get to Wikipedia. Incredible, because <laughs> it was there. There was thoughts that apparently uh, that this was this this comment was made in jest, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> and then they got it's the right to vote. So at that point, like this is not a situation where Wyoming was the wokest state ever. There were aspects of this that were so cold and calculating that they were woke. 
Yeah, well, I mean, that's the old horseshoe theory at work for you. But, I, I mean, you got to think at, at least somebody in this chain of reasoning. I don't know if that was – was that a unilateral decision by the governor or was there, like, so there was so this And it all happened in South Pass City. So, like, the where the things went down was in South Pass City. They wanted people to come out in South Pass City because South Pass City was the fastest-growing town, up, like, statistically in the country, perhaps on the planet at the time because a dude mm -hmm. found gold one time. So – they're having this meeting in South Pass City, and here a quote, quote, damn it, uh, if you're going to let the people and people vote, then we'll let the women vote also. Then there was, that was reported. He, in said, he said people and people? Correct. No, don't even need to suggest the words that were actually used, but they are basically what you think that they were. So th this was the governor saying that, or this is just like somebody at the council? This is according to a Cheyenne newspaper, and the website I'm on right now is wyohistory.org. The article is titled Right Choice, Wrong Reasons in Wyoming. And uh, yeah. yes, so it was, and this is and this is where we get into the politics part of this, Democrats and Republicans. Republicans wanted former slaves to have the right to vote uh, as much as they possibly could. Democrats wanted to use that against them, and this is ground zero for the right to vote, if you don't know, is in Kansas, and that's where the term Jayhawks come from. A bunch of Massachusetts people moved to Kansas registered as voters, and then they voted for um, former slaves. And they became terrible at football. Awful at football. But then Massachusetts apparently invented basketball, but they did it in Kansas. I don't know. So, yes, this was – that comment was made – uh, I'm trying to get the person that said it right. William Bright, who was an uneducated saloon keeper, stalwart, ex-Democrat, Union Army veteran, president of the council – was one of the main backers of the of the uh, the vote. So I think was that the governor? I mean, John. Blah, blah, blah. So there was was it was Bright. So Bright was the president of the council. They can't have a governor at this time. It was not a state. Ah, uh, yeah. So and, and this was probably just for like the South Pass locality as opposed to the whole correct Wyoming territory. Correct. Yeah. Like in a, but, so the House passed the amendment to raise the to do all of this in 1860. Whatever it was. Six to two was, was when this happened. But all these, these comments were available in various newspapers that were in Cheyenne and South Pass City that uh, <laughs> uh, he thought that perhaps uh, it was a joke. However, um, there were amendments like you live in D.C. I don't. Po the way the politics works is I think that I saw this on West Wing and I've heard it here and there since a Christmas tree amendment. Are you familiar with this term? A Christmas tree no. bill? A Christmas tree bill is like a big, large sweeping bill, like a budget or something. And then a bunch of different people call in their favors to get their thing, their little thing attached on it. They just hang it on. Oh, like the pork. Yeah, pork barrel. Yeah, cork barrel. There you go. Yeah. So this sort of became that for various rights. The most discriminated against group and subgroup of people in the Western Hemisphere then and continues to be to this day are women of non-white origin. This is um, at this point the quote was colored women in, in, in the newspaper and also squaws, which are derogatory terms. They were not given the right to vote. They're the only people uh, that amendment failed uh, right away. So but close. Then, but then it, 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 that, it was hap that, that was in the original situation, 1869, when it was ratified and whatnot in 1870, 1871, it was extended to all people. But the, the you know, non-white women are still probably have it the worst in this country in terms of things like that out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. And we can see, of course, the way that the natives were treated. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, and I guess it just goes to show, I mean, history has patterns that happen all over the place. I mean, that's kind of the, 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 the social pecking order. And, you know, obviously we're trying to move past that. Having a really tough time of it. But, you know, I mean, you got to think at some point during these discussions, somebody went, well, yeah, we're letting the so-and-sos and the so-and-sos and the she-so-and-sos have the right to vote. Does that say something about those kinds of folks then? Yeah. Yep. So I think, I think so too. And this is what my conclusion as a Wyoming, I former Wyoming, I am now a Pennsylvanian to become North Carolinian. Um, Wyoming is incredibly misunderstood. I think a lot of places are just in media because like flyover states and whatnot. Wyoming and Montana, I would kind of group together portions of North Dakota and South Dakota, but the mentality is not accurately captured anywhere. There's a, a tendency to kind of think that the cowboy attitude and the gold rush attitude of Wyoming is sort of like what was happening in Oregon and California. That's not quite true. Or like the cowboy vibes of what's happening in the South and Texas. Again, also not quite true. There is a much colder, I'd say that to be frank with you, we relate most closely with historical Russians 
with like a big, just double barrel middle fingers to everybody. And we see that the most noble thing that Wyoming has ever, ever done was in this vote. And it wasn't just to give women the right to vote. So what the guy said was, Hey, if people are going to get the right to vote, then they're all going to get the right to vote. I don't care. To be frank with you, I'll use a very blatant term. Like, Fuck it. Do it. Don't care. That's more of a Wyoming attitude. And what ended up happening to this, the real nobility of this uh, came not in giving the women the right to vote, but in standing up to the then rising most powerful country in the world, these United States, because Wyoming was attempting very strongly to becoming a state. Uh, other states that were trying to become states, Utah, California, other places had tried to do women's suffrage. Other states that were states had tried to do women's suffrage. This is the clever game theory party. You ready for this? In order to ratify an amendment to a state constitution or the national constitution, you have to have a huge majority of people agreeing to it. It's like two thirds or 75%, depending on which state or country you're in, right? Not true for territories. Oh, really? Correct. You just had to have, it was like, a, like not a simple majority, but a little bit more than a simple majority. So when Wyoming did that, they weren't a state. We were not a state at the time and were applying for statehood and other national senators and representatives were super pissed that we did this behind their back. And the governor of Wyoming said, we would avoid the United States for a hundred years rather than come in without our women. I'm pretty sure a lot of people who live there today would do exactly the same thing. Probably not for those reasons, but just principle really. I think top to bottom. And that's the interesting thing about the state is like, that's, I mean, it may, gives me tremendous pride, like fine. And, and I said this in the prom promotional thing like this, we don't need you. You can't hang here attitude is a thing. There's an underlying for like a fraternity of like, you can, you can hack it out here anyway. Oh, for sure. So, so this last year, well, 2020 was the 150th anniversary of women's suffrage in Wyoming. As we talked about the first ballot was cast in 1870. And so to celebrate that the Casper star tribune state's biggest newspaper, uh, interviewed a bunch of women from around the state and asked some questions like, what does it mean to you to be a Wyoming woman? And I love some of these answers here. Uh, so for example, uh, Alyssa Ruckel, uh, who is the owner of a business called Elevate Wyoming, uh, when asked what being a Wyoming woman means to her, uh, she said, grit, compassion, selflessness, community-minded, uh, other example or other answers, tough, resourceful, smart, a lot of grit, a lot of people saying grit, grit, you know, yep. It's a, it, it's a tough place to, it's a tough place to live. And yeah, you can only imagine how much more difficult it must've been a long time ago. And I, and I actually want to talk to you about a fascinating person that I've been reading about recently. Uh, so I'm reading a book about geology. It's written by John McPhee. It's called Annals of the former world. John McPhee's sure. famous, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the Pulitzer Prize winning mm -hmm. book here. Awesome journalism. The guy's going around the U.S., basically going along I-80 and, and talking about the geology of whatever area is in. And there's a whole chapter devoted to Wyoming. And it's through the lens of the Love family. So there's a family of people, Scottish immigrants, and uh, there was well, a Scottish immigrant who uh, later married uh, an American woman. Uh, but it's this woman's story that I kind of want to talk about just to illustrate how difficult it is to or must have been to uh, to be a woman in a place like this so her name was ethel waxham uh, she would become the mother of one of the greatest geologists uh, really in in the entire field of study uh, but she basically came out of wellesley college and decided to be an educator on the frontier and she had to get in a wagon and go for days and days and miles and miles across completely unforgiving terrain, blizzards, snowblown roadways, and have cowboys basically uh, take her to where she wanted to go so that she could teach in a one-room schoolhouse and have a handful of pupils at a time ranging all ages from kids to like adults who didn't know how to read. Very She's romantic. The, Very oh, romantic. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and, and this is an educated person. I mean, she knows Latin and Greek and all kinds of romance languages and German and, you know, just a really educated, cultured person. And she's helping a community way, way, way far away from where she's from in a different place than she's ever known. And uh, she was often the only woman for miles, like 50, 60 miles, uh, just because there, there weren't that many people there. And you know, it was a, it was an unforgiving environment for women, especially because, you know, culturally, uh, women just weren't invited 
weren't, they didn't fit in. And so for somebody to make their way in that kind of place at that time, unbelievable to me. Yeah, it, it really is unbelievable. And it's interesting that you say that because at the time, as we mentioned, giving former slaves, freed slaves, the right to vote was the priority of the then Republican Party. And now when I say Republican and Democrat, I would like you to think like, what about pre-Kennedy? Because it's probably not the same priorities as the parties now. Well, <laughs> the Republican Party uh, wanted to give former slaves the right to vote in Kansas. They're focusing on Kansas and they realize that attaching women's rights to vote nationally to that just pissed a lot of people off, mostly Democrats, then Democrats at the time. But then in Wyoming, they realized like, we're going to do that. That's going to be fine. That was immediately done, like giving former slaves the right to vote and also immigrants who got citizenship in the territory, Chinese people to build Chinese immigrants to build the, the, um, the railroads that was easy for them. But in Wyoming, they kind of deviated from the national parties and they thought, well, we'll do, we'll do women now because the other places they didn't want to do it. But part of the thinking, Chris, was they wanted to signal to the country that it's better to be a woman here than it is anywhere else, which is not true in terms of how freaking difficult it was. But they knew the percentages were like 18% of the population were women. Like 18%. That's it? Yes, it was sick. What is it, an engineering school? Yeah, it was... <laughs> Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, there it is. Okay. There it is. Um, yeah, so it was bad. So they wanted to advertise to people to become a state. They wanted good press in D.C. And they wanted to advertise to women, you can live here. And it sounds like um, it, that wasn't a failing effort. No, I mean, the, there's a reason the nickname for the state is the equality state. You know, there's a reason the state motto is just equal rights. Uh, and... That's because they did want to signal that this is the kind of place where you can live a different life than you've ever known. Uh, unfortunately, it was probably a lot more difficult, as you said. But I mean, the right to the right to vote, which is really something that everyone everywhere should have had at all times in all places, uh, is now something that people are coming around and, and recognizing. Yeah, and I, I think that and something I want to touch on here as a former Wyoming guy, and I don't. Like I, my personal opinion is that if you don't pay taxes in a place, that's none of your business. But as someone who graduated from the fraternity, I'm not scared to talk about it. So one thing that I hate about the way that the state is portrayed is that we get into this narrative bias where we feed the narrative, look, something happened. Like we all know where our lines in the sand are. And then we get online and we fight each other and that's fine. Mm. I am married to someone who is in a field that just bumped from six to 9% women. So this nine is my spouse is aggressively sort of right behind the people who blazed the trail. She did not know that the right to vote for women was accomplished in, in the United States and in Wyoming. This is not taught. This is not something that people know about it. And to me, that's incredibly frustrating. South Pass City, there should be a monument to this. It should be a tourist attraction. And by the way, it's in a very beautiful, haunting, lonely, cold, awful place. If, if, you are, if, you're, if you're a settler and you, when you visit it, you think, Damn, in the 1800s, this must have sucked. And Absolutely. There should be a monument there. Yeah, I mean, in John McPhee's book, I just read a section where uh, Ethel was teaching her kids in the home, doing homeschooling while they're in between chores, and a cowboy came in because he got his finger caught between the rope and the saddle horn, and it was hanging on by a couple of threads, and she just paused what she was doing and got out the water and scissors and some thread and cut the finger off and fed it to the dogs and sewed up the wound and said, oh, well, after a month, you'll forget it even happened and just continued teaching. And she just did that. Yep. I mean, that, it, it, it's a remarkable, re remarkable spirit out there. And yeah, and I, I think, you know, part of the reason that that kind of thing isn't really taught or preached is probably just because, you know, there's so few people that live in Wyoming. People don't really care. Yeah. You know, and it, like I said, it's flyover state. People in Wyoming are so far behind the times that like as far as bachelor's degrees and whatnot, like that is true. Like statistically speaking, probably not per capita, the most highly educated place. Like, that's true. But the facts are facts. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a different way of living there. The right to vote for women on planet earth was established in, in good old Wyoming. Not All right, Nick. Like, now that, that brings us to, so that brings us to some controversy. So when we were doing the advertising for this, uh, on social media, uh, we said, okay, this was the first place in the world to have women's suffrage. And right away, like we hadn't even finished the episode right away. A friend of mine said, well, I don't think that's really true. Uh, shout out to Jillian uh, who sent me 
a little piece of information saying that uh, the actual first place to allow women to vote was allegedly a place called Pitcairn Island. Oh, uh, I know where Pitcairn Island is. Pitcairn Island, uh, yeah, has been in the news recently due to an incredible sexual assault scandal. Yes, times have changed in Pitcairn Island. <laughs> the Pitcairn Island is famous for its mutiny. Yes, which is how it got started. So when we made this claim that Wyoming was the first place in the world to allow women to vote, we were going on what is on the Wyoming State Historical Society website uh, in an article about the 150th anniversary of women's suffrage in the territory. So they their website says, the following year, in March, women first served on juries in Laramie in September 6, 1870, and also in Laramie. Louisa Swain became the first woman to cast a ballot under the world's first law, granting women equal and unrestricted voting rights with men. So a couple of possibilities at play here. Number one, Wyoming State Historical Society is just wrong. Maybe they just have bad information. I don't know what what the case is. I mean, it's a state historical society, so I'm not really inclined to think like, oh, well, they just forgot to Google. What I think it might be is the, the qualifying language here, the world's first law granting women equal and unrestricted voting rights. I don't know what the voting rights situation was in Pitcairn Island. I couldn't really find a good description of it. I mean, as far as I can tell, the colony started because of a mutiny, officially became a British territory in the 1830s, and then in 1838 uh, allowed women to vote. And I kind of thought, well, you know, maybe it's just because there weren't that many people there. I mean, I looked it up, and there weren't even really 100 people in the colony. But then I remembered, well, there weren't that many people in Wyoming either. So that's probably not it. So I wonder if it was just a more of a loose organization or if voting was carried out in a different sense, because I think the reference on the Wyoming State Historical Society page is to the election of officials as opposed to like referendums. And there's, or, there's a lot. There's a mo- like we said earlier, the most controversial part of it was that in certain counties or different uh, jurisprudence, jurisdiction areas or whatever, women were required to serve on juries for the first time that jury, a jury of your peers was deciding your fate, which is a constitutionally protected right, even for territories. So yes, yeah, so like whether or not women got the right to vote in Pitcairn Island for when there were 70 people living there, I think there were less than a hundred for the most part. There are less than a hundred now. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I still stand by the fact that the, the government of the United States who beat England and who purchased all this stuff from Napoleon, one of the Civil War, like the largest territorial country in the Western Hemisphere, had to legally stand on the floor in Washington, D.C. and recognize that in this country, there's a place where women can vote and serve on juries and be appointed and be elected. And like all of those things, like, and then the way I worded it on Facebook, I used semicolons because I knew this would happen. I knew that there were places that due to population, women would get the right to vote, but I don't mean the right to vote was the first place only. It was the right to vote plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this. It was a true suffrage bill. Women were not equal one day and they were far more equal the next day. Literally like that. Much more equal. So the country that claims to have pioneered the right for universal women's suffrage is it's New Zealand. Of course, it's New Zealand. Uh, they allege that women uh, got the right to vote nationally for the first time in 1893 there. And they actually have a really interesting history, uh, like a timeline of when different territories had different uh, women's suffrage you know, and, and voting arrangements there. So actually, uh, according to New Zealand's history, uh, but between 1776 and 1807, New Jersey Uh, allowed propertied women to vote in elections uh, starting from 1787. Uh, They had the right in 1776, but then the Constitution came along. However, uh, they lost that suffrage when universal male suffrage was introduced. So still qualifiers, still based on race, class, all kinds of stuff, and not really in the spirit of equality. Right. Then the timeline continues with Pitcairn Island in 1838, but then they also qualify that by saying that In 1856, the population of Pitcairn Island moved to Norfolk Island. I don't know where Norfolk Island is, but (laughs) I don't know if they just left and they took their democracy with them or and like maybe it's a discontinuous population that lives on the island. And so maybe that's why it's like the oldest law like Wyoming's is older because it's, you know, 
have been a continuous place. I don't know what the deal is, but uh, the next place on the timeline is Wyoming in, in 1869, and then uh, Louisa Swain casting her ballot in 1870. Right, yeah, and, like, and, that, and that, that's another part of this that is really interesting, too, is the land ownership. I believe I was reading right before we went on, I just wanted to check facts. I think that Wyoming was also among the first places to allow women to own property separate from the property owned by their husbands. Yeah, so there were uh, there were some women's firsts in in, in ownership. So the the first women newspaper owners in uh, were in Wyoming. Uh, Laura and Gertrude Huntington. Uh, they bought the Platte Valley Liar, which is based in Saratoga, uh, and they did that in 1890. I don't know if they did that before it was a state. Uh, when did it become a state? July second, I think. I don't know if that was before or after statehood. I don't know if it was in the territory or, or in statehood or whatever, but they bought the newspaper in Saratoga. Oh, Saratoga. That's a cool place. Yeah, great place. Been to, been, been to Saratoga. So if anybody wants to make the trek to pay homage to women's suffering uh, or suffrage, suffrage <laughs> and suffering, both of those I think are true. Jesus. Especially in the 1800s. The South Pass City is very, it's readily Googleable and whatnot. If you've seen the, fl- the film... Uh, Wind River, very much where that kind of takes place, except it is a kind of an old, I don't want to say abandoned, but basically abandoned gold rush town that is in the it's heart of the... Town. It's ghost town. Yes. It is a gold rush town who uh, largely abandoned. There's some reason. There are people that live there. You and I used to go camping walking distance from South Pass City very often when we were young. It's gorgeous there. The Wind River Mountains are among the oldest rocks on the planet, uh, if you want to see it, but it's... It, I, th- I would like to start a trend where people go to South Pass City and have a moment where like, this is where this place. I'm sure the Fremont County Tourism Board would like that as well. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm sure they would. So, Chris, I think, um, I, think, I think that covers it. Did we miss anything? No, I don't think so. But I think now would be a good time to uh, close out with just a list of some amazing first from when it's like we didn't even we didn't even get to all of the women who were elected so let's just do a speed run here so the first female legislator in wyoming was mary bellamy in 1910 then the first female mayor in wyoming was elected in 1912 susan whistler of dayton then the first town governed by women dubbed the petticoat government was jackson who elected three council women a female town marshal and a female mayor in 1920 jackson yeah Leading the way, as always. Thanks, Jackson. We, God, we're grateful for you. The first female governor in the United States was Nellie Taylor Ross. She was elected governor on November 5th, 1924. The first woman elected to the Eastern Shoshone Tribal Business Council was Irene Kinnear Mead in 1930. The first female state senator in the U.S. was Dora McGrath of Hot Springs County. They're mob, baby. Mm. The first female state treasurer was Minnie Mitchell. First female state auditor, also Minnie Mitchell. Pretty impressive career for her. The the list goes on, but the point is, Wyoming women have been blazing trails since before it was even really considered a place. Yep. And And they they continue continue to inspire inspire through through grit, grit, compassion, compassion, service, service, hard hard work, work, stick-to-itiveness. Thanks, Thanks, Dale. Dale. Mm -hmm. Coining that that term. term. A lot, so, of, Chris, a lot of reasons, reasons to be inspired and a lot of, of, uh, a lot lot of things, things to be grateful, grateful for. for. I will leave you with the following thought that a few years back, the Wyoming Cowboys mascot, the mascot of the University of Wyoming, was called out for possibly being racist and sexist. And I want to point out two things to you as someone who grew up there. One, the natives were the best cowboys, and we all know that for damn sure. You gall dang right. Number two, right. there's no question that anybody that lives there goes to school there or grew up there, that the cowgirls are far, far tougher than the cowboys. I would never go out of my way to hold the door open for a woman from Wyoming unless she asked me to. You gall dang right about that. And with that, we're going to get out of here. Game Theory, subscribe, like, rate, review, email us. Do whatever you want. Live your best life. Thanks, Chris. Go, folks.